Let us pray. Our Father, we thank you because we're here today and we know that the study today will contribute to our lives' progress in Jesus' name. Father, we're asking that as we study week by week from these pages of Scripture, you'll make us to be the people we ought to be in Jesus' name. We're asking that you'll open up our understanding, open up our spirit, and the spirit of the living God will apply that part of truth to our hearts that will make us victorious day by day in Jesus' name. We have the conviction that you have called us one by one in whichever places you have placed us, just like you called the Apostle Paul. And we've been watching this Apostle Paul from place to place in his journey and in his pilgrimage we know that he depended so much upon you and he was successful in the things that you called him to do we're studying all these things so that we too by your grace and power will be successful in what you have called us to do and we pray that the victory jesus christ won on the cross for us will be ours personally in jesus name Teach us today again. Touch us in our spirits. Lead us by your own spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're studying from Acts of the Apostles, chapter 18. As I've told you before, we're still with Paul the Apostle. The more you read from him, the more you live with him, to, so to say, the more you see how he yielded to the Holy Spirit and all his life was under the control of the Holy Spirit, the more you are turned into the image of the Lord Jesus Christ and conformed to him because he was a sincere, diligent, wholehearted follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Holy Spirit has seen it fit and suitable to preserve much of his ministry and life for us in the Acts of the Apostles. It's written for the church, and we as part of the church must learn a lot from it. Last week, we studied Acts chapter 17, and in the verses that we studied, we saw him in Athens, a great city where we had intellectuals, philosophers, and people that were highly placed in that whole world were told that in the age in which Paul lived, Athens was a very great city with a great university, even at that time. And we're told that almost all the orators and the great men of significance in those days made sure that they got to Athens and they made a mark of Athens. It was a city of great literary achievement, secular achievement, scientific achievement, oratory achievement, achievement in every significant way, but it, also, it was also a city of idolatry. In fact, we were told that there were as many idols as there were houses in Athens. And when they couldn't make any other idol, when they couldn't name any other idol, they named an idol, they built an altar to the unknown God. And Paul got into that place and he preached the gospel. Some of the people received what he preached and they became converted. Others mourned. Others felt they were listening to him at another time. But now in Acts chapter 18, he moves on to Corinth. We can say that since the day that Paul got converted, there was one thing uppermost in his heart that was to make Jesus known. Think about it. From that very place that he met the Lord Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus, the singular thing in his heart the vision of his life, the goal of his own life, the thing that drove him and moved him, moved him along was to make Jesus known. And the very first question he asked the Lord is, what shall I do? What must I do? 
he was willing to be told what to do and he wanted to make Jesus known we're told that in Damascus he prayed for three days fasted for three days just looking up to the Lord and from that time he began to see a vision of Ananias coming unto him the way you start your Christian life matters a lot the way Paul the Apostle started his Christian life asking the question in submission what must I do was the thing that carried him all through his life let me ask you how did you start your Christian life I mean when you were born again did you start with a submissive attitude what shall I do what will you help me to do did you start with praying did you start with waiting upon the Lord did you start with depending upon the Lord you know the very first day of his Christian life the moment he was born again the very first three days he, sh he was shut out from every other person he couldn't see anybody he could only see the Lord you know that's what happened all through his Christian journey all through his Christian life people were shut out of his life he continually saw the Lord and he continually obeyed the Lord and he's been going on now since that time preaching the gospel and how wonderful that we meet him in Acts chapter 18 discouraged not tired having problems and burdened with problems but not fading out having some real depression in the mind discouragement in the mind despair in the mind and yet still committed to the preaching of the gospel it seems as if in Athens he had not had the usual response that he would have but now eventually after some had believed and had made sure that they were secured in the hands of those who carry them on in the ways of the Lord he traveled down to Corinth now Paul the Apostle always went to major 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 cities and we as a church we have a lot to learn from that he went to major cities now take um, our country for example we have cities we have some smaller towns we have some villages we have some hamlets we have some farm establishments of just little little groups of people Paul will go to the major towns like our city here Lagos we'll go to a city like Ibada we'll go to a city like Calabar just the major major cities he'll raise up great preachers of the gospel among those converts in those major cities he will raise up people elders preachers evangelists soul winners teachers of the word of god in those major cities then he will leave them to go to the neighboring towns and villages and spread the gospel he will plant a dynamic growing church in the major cities and then the members of that growing church dynamic church will be responsible for planting churches all around them and the lord has led us in that same way we have started in this major city here and then we have gone into the major cities of this nation and from the major cities we have uh, taught that our pastors and preachers in those major cities will now go to the local government areas and go to the villages and go to the places in those states still in Bible pattern but then in going to the major cities he was led of the Lord and I must say that we're grateful to God looking back now at the major cities in which this church has reached out we thank God because the church in the major cities, uh, uh, the churches are growing. That's an indication that we have been following the Lord. Because if we didn't follow the Lord, He will not be able to water what is planted. He will not be able to establish what is being done. Now, Paul the Apostle went to these major cities and he was led of the Spirit of God. He always depended upon the Lord, led by His Spirit. He has now come to Corinth 
Corinth was a major town. In fact, it was the provincial capital of the government of the day. It was the city of trade and the city of commerce. It was not like Athens where you had uh, the university, the philosophers, the scientists, the literary people, the common people, but then the traders. It was the meeting point of all the places those who really did business of the day. But then it was a very loose, living, worldly city. There was so much immorality. In fact, in those days, one of the most terrible, abusive language anybody could call you was to say, why are you behaving like a Corinthian? That means, why are you so loose like this? Why are you so immoral, impure like this? Corinth was a very, very bad town, but here we're encouraged that as terrible as Corinth was, the historians of that, of that time, that is, students of ancient history, They've told us that if you take the worst of London, the worst of Paris, and bring them all together, you had the city of Corinth at that time. Things were very bad. And yet, in the providence of the Lord, in the leading of the Lord, a church, lively church, dynamic church, spirit-guided church, a church full of the gifts of the Spirit was planted in Corinth. What an encouragement to us that no matter how bad a city may be, no matter how bad a community may be in our country here, the Lord by His power, in His Spirit, can still plant a lively church there. In our passage, we're going to see three sections. Number one, Spirit-guided preachers in Corinth. Number two, scriptural proclamation to the circumcision to the Jews. And three, saved people in the city. Let's read verses one to three. After these things, Paul departed from Athens and came to Corinth and found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontius, lately come from Italy, with his wife Priscilla, because that Claudius had commanded all Jews to depart from Rome and came unto them. And because he was of the same craft, the same trade, the same profession, he abode with them and wrought. For by their occupation they were tent makers. Now I've told you that the Lord is keeping us on the Acts of the Apostles because there is a lot to learn. Two weeks ago, when I had the opportunity of teaching at the Monday Bible study here, I, I talked to you on what the Spirit of the Lord has been telling us right from the beginning of Acts of the Apostles, and how Paul the Apostle came in, and what the Lord has been using him to do. Now, have you noticed since we have started Acts of the Apostles that Paul the Apostle had no distracting friend in his life? think about it. Paul the Apostle. All the people that surrounded him, name them one by one. Silas, Timothy, Luke, Barnabas in his time, at another time other people, they were people that had the same vision, the same thirst, the same passion for souls. There was no friend, no intimate friend of Paul the Apostle that could distract him that will make him to stop a little bit, that will make him to rest a little bit, to withdraw a little bit. The people that were around him, they were people having the same vision. And if you are going to succeed in the calling that God has given you, if you are going to succeed in the thing that the Lord wants you to do in life, because you have only one life to live, and you have the goal set before you, and you have the field white and white before you. If you are going to succeed in the thing that the Lord is calling you for, there must be no distracting friend or relative in your life. Paul didn't hate them. He just wasn't influenced by them, distracted by them, bogged down by them, drawn back by them. He was always on the go. 
Have you also seen how he was militant, active, aggressive, always on the move in his life? You know, never staying back, never just resting back. But all, he kept going all the time. If he wasn't preaching, he was writing. If he wasn't writing, he was praying. If he wasn't in Athens, he was um, in Corinth. He was always doing something for the Lord. And the Lord gave him the strength spiritually and physically to do that. Now, he was in Corinth. And he had been led by the Spirit of the Lord. He never depended upon his own strength, never depended upon his own wisdom. And in our preaching of the gospel, as we move from city to city, as we move from place to place, it will be important that we depend upon the Lord of the harvest. He knows where the fruit is ripe. He knows where to reap at this time. He knows the people whose minds are prepared, whose hearts are prepared to receive the preaching of the gospel. And we should move out at the leading of the Lord, at the leading of the Spirit of the Lord, because he knows the hearts of all men. In Proverbs chapter 3, from verse 5, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways, acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Paul the apostle depended upon the spirit of the Lord, and he was guided like that. <coughs> and it's so wonderful when we too can be led, not by a committee, not by a group of religious people, not by a board of decision makers, but by the Spirit of the Lord. And if there is anything that has helped this church in our reaching out, in our evangelizing, it is that we have depended upon the leading of the Spirit of God. Not a committee, not a board of decision makers, but just on the Lord, just like Paul did. There were times that the Spirit of the Lord restrained Paul the Apostle. I will not allow him to go to a particular place. The committee didn't change the decision of the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter 16, <coughs> verse 6, Now when they had gone throughout Phrygia and the region of Galatia, they were forbidden and were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia. After they were come to Mysia, they are saved or they endeavored to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit suffered them not. Restraint of the Spirit. So that it was the Holy Spirit taking this decision as to what next city to go. In Romans chapter 1, reading from verse 9, For God is my witness whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his son, that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers, making request, having prayer request, talking to the Lord about it. If by any means now at least, after a long time, I might have a prosperous journey by the will of God to come unto you. He had the desire to go to Rome, but the desire did not send him to Rome. He had the interest to go to Rome, but the interest did not move him to go to Rome. He still must pray. He still must ask God. He still must check off from God. And in verse 13, Now I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, that often times I purposed, I determined to come unto you, but was led either to, was hindered either to, was restrained either to, that I might have some fruit among you also, even as among other Gentiles. He wanted to. But then he must wait for the leading of the Spirit of God. How wonderful it is for us if in our lives we are sensitive to the leading of the Spirit of God. That even when we want to, even when we are interested in doing something, we are still waiting for the leading, for the touch, for the guidance of the Holy Spirit as for the right time and the right place to carry that thing on, to get it done. 
At this time, he was led to Corinth. We know he was led to Corinth because the Lord spoke to him in Corinth. Look at Acts chapter 18, verses 9 and 10. Then spake the Lord to Paul in the night by a vision. Be not afraid, but speak and hold not thy peace, for I am with thee, and no man shall set on thee to hurt thee, for I have much people in this city. He heard from the Lord. We have learned a lesson there. In our witnessing, in our evangelism, we should hear from the Lord. It is true that we are to preach the gospel to every creature, but then, not every creature is ready right now. There are some of the creatures, there are some of the people around you that are ready just now. And if you are led by the Spirit of God, you will be led to those people, you speak to them, and they will receive just at that time. Others are not ready now. It may take them another week to become ready, another month to become ready, another period of time to become ready when they become ready the lord will move you out to them to speak unto them so that they will receive the gospel that's so very important for us as fellowship leaders area leaders and zona leaders that you're always depending upon the lord oh yes we're preaching the gospel oh yes we want everybody to be saved but the lord will be leading us that that person is ready talk to him now and you'll speak the right word at the right time in Acts chapter 16 verses verse 14 and a certain woman named Lydia a seller of purple of the city of Tatira which worshiped God heard us whose heart the Lord opened you see at this time the Lord opened the heart of Lydia it's not only opening the city of Corinth for the Apostle Paul to go there, that's a major thing for the evangelist to decide, for the evangelist to look up to the Lord and be taught by the Spirit of God. But even for an individual, the Spirit of the Lord had opened the heart of Lydia. And because of that, she listened. She was attentive, that she attended unto the things which were spoken by of Paul. And when she was baptized and her household, she besought us, saying, If ye have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come into my house and abide there. And she constrained us. Let's always listen to the Holy Spirit. He knows where the work will be most fruitful. He knows where the need is greatest right now. And Paul the Apostle got into Corinth. I told you that he was with much fear and trembling. He was discouraged and dis uh, despondent at this time. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 3. And I was with you. Looking back at the time I was with them, he now reflected back. And he said, you remember, I was with you in weakness, in fear, and in much trembling. Now, there are times when a Christian worker will be in weakness, physical weakness, emotionally weak, not quite alive and motivated and happy and joyful and jumping, but weak, and yet the vision is there. Passion for souls still there. The desire to win the loss to the Lord still there, yet we and in fear. In fear. That is looking at the city, almost despairing, saying, I'm just coming from Athens, the city of philosophers, and the city of scientists, and the city of orators, and the city of idol worshippers, and just a few of them responded, here am I in Corinth now. And all these people are so worldly and so impure and so immoral. Will these people accept in fear and in much trembling? Lonely and alone because Timothy wasn't there. Silas wasn't there. And in much trembling. Yet Paul kept on preaching in our lives. If you will understand that doing the will of God 
should be as important to you as eating your food every day, as sleeping every night, as still doing the necessary things every day. It wouldn't matter whether you are weak, you still like to take your bath. It wouldn't matter whether you are in fear, you still like to eat every day. And it doesn't matter whether it's with much trembling. There are some things in your life that are permanent that you know I must do it. No matter what I feel emotionally, no matter what I'm, I am physically, I must keep going. That's Paul. That's the way he took preaching the gospel. That even though it was with much weakness and fear and much trembling, he kept going on. But then the Lord brought other preachers into his life. Come back to Acts chapter 18, verse 2 and verse 3. And he found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontius, lately come from Italy, with his wife Priscilla. Now just at this time, when Paul needed companions, just at this time, when Paul needed supporters, just at this time, when Paul needed associates that would be of an encouragement to him, the Lord brought these people from Italy and they were encouraged at the same time. You know, if you have the zeal, if you have the vision, if you have the passion for souls, even though discouraging times might come, even though trembling times might come, the Lord knows how to bring the right people into your life at the right time that will keep you going, that will keep you supported, that will keep you uh, on top of all your troubles. And in verse 3, because he was of the same craft or trade or profession with them, he abode with them and he wrote, for by their profession they were tent makers. He kept on working, supported himself during the day, and then at times of opportunity he preached the gospel. Now how did he preach the gospel? First Corinthians chapter 2 from verse 1 first corinthians chapter 2 from verse 1 and i brethren when i came to you reflecting back on when he was in corinth preaching the gospel i came not with excellency of speech of wisdom declaring unto you the testimony of god for i determined not to know anything among you save jesus christ and him crucified. He didn't discuss politics. He didn't discuss commerce, which Corinth was noted for. He didn't discuss inflation, which was a regular thing they discussed as the market was going up and down. He did not discuss the normal thing, the average thing, the secular things. He said, I determined not to know anything. I determined not to know tribal things, traditional things, political things, secular things, commercial things. I was interested in one thing, just Jesus Christ and him crucified. How wonderful it will be today if we as children of God, if we as Christian workers will determine that the thing that will take our attention will not be the commerce of the land, will not be the politics of the land, will not be the things that take the attentions of other people, but Jesus Christ and him crucified. Wanting to proclaim the Lord Jesus Christ, wanting to preach the gospel, wanting to tell people that Jesus saves, and that is the thing that arrests our attention. You know, if Paul the Apostle had not been a person like that, he wouldn't have been able to do anything in Athens because we're told that the architecture, the, the, the beauty of Athens at that time, it was just a fantastic thing. But yet, as it went around, he looked at those houses were beautiful, majestic, and massive, but nothing interested him. He saw that the people were wholly given to idolatry. His spirit was stirred within him, wanting to tell them of the Lord Jesus Christ. Every city, every place that Paul the Apostle went, he wasn't interested in material things. He wasn't interested in the money. He wasn't interested in commerce. He wasn't interested in politics. Jesus Christ and him crucified. And when we are like that today, much will be done in the preaching of the gospel. Now, the companions that came into his life, Acts chapter 18, Aquila and Priscilla, they too were preachers, dynamic preachers, serious preachers. Acts chapter 18, verse 26, and he began to speak boldly in the synagogue, referring to Apollos. 
whom when Aquila and Priscilla had heard, they took him unto them and expounded unto him the way of God more perfectly. In Romans chapter 16, from verse 3, Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my helpers in Christ Jesus, who have for my life laid down their own necks, unto whom not only I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. Likewise, greet the church that is in their house. Aquila and Priscilla were a couple, and they were also preachers of the gospel. And they came into the life of Paul at this time. Led by the Spirit of God, he was led into Corinth. Led by the Spirit of God, he was led to associate with companions that became the greatest helpers in his life and the most loyal supporters to his ministry. Now, as he got into Corinth, how, what did he do in the preaching of the gospel? Acts chapter 18, from verse 4. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded the Jews and the Greeks. He reasoned. That means he presented his points in a logical fashion. In Acts chapter 17 verse 2, And Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them, and three Sabbath days reasoned, reasoned with them out of the scriptures. Now you can see that Paul the Apostle was a person that would logically, convincingly reason out and proclaim the preaching of the gospel. In Acts of the Apostles chapter 14, Acts chapter 14, verse 1, And it came to pass in Iconium that they went both together into the synagogue of the Jews and so spake. The word so, the qualifying word so there is telling you the manner in which he presented the gospel. He so spake that a great multitude, both of the Jews and also of the Greeks, believed. If we're really going to do a lasting work for the Lord, there is no time for haphazard preaching. A type of message that has no structure, no introduction, nobody building, no conclusion. A type of message that just, you know, takes a verse there and takes a verse there and then jumps up and jumps down to a totally emotional without reasoning out, logically convincing the people that this is the word of the Lord, that Jesus Christ is Lord. But you cannot do that if you are not a real student of the Bible. Not only a student of the Bible, if you are not um, diligently taught and trained in communication, you cannot reason out, logically present, convincingly present the word of the Lord. And um, what a shame today that many public evangelists, soul winners, preachers in various churches and in our church too, they do not take time to learn on communication to learn on presentation of the gospel, to learn on reasoning and logically presenting the truth of the Bible. And they will just come and prepare, they will just come and present the message, and it is not clear to anybody what they are, what they are about. But you know, we must learn communication, how to communicate the message we are presenting, and we must learn the word of God and present the word of God in a powerful way. Come back to Acts chapter 18. He reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded the Jews and the Greeks, persuaded, persuaded the Greeks and the Jews. And when Silas and Timotheus were come from Macedonia, Paul was pressed in the spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus was Christ. Many times we read all these passages and we just bypass them. I will say, well, he preached the gospel. Like Philip preached the gospel. Like Peter preached the gospel. But the preaching of Paul was different. Completely different. 
Now Peter was an apostle Paul was also an apostle Both of them had met the Lord Both of them were saved Both of them were living holy lives They were sanctified in a definite way They were baptized in the Holy Ghost Both of them had the gifts of the Spirit Working in their lives Both were concerned To see people turn to Christ Yet they were different They were different And it is very clear that Paul the Apostle Had been trained Had been educated Had been prepared To reach many Many types of people That Peter could never Never reach What would Peter have said Before those philosophers in Athens Before those Epicureans in Athens He was a simple fisherman and um, he received the Holy Ghost and kept on preaching. But pray to people that could understand him. Pray to people of his own nation, his own people, most of the time. But Paul the Apostle was able to talk to sophisticated Athenians and was able also to reach the common Corinthians. We're told that the Jews were sign seekers. Paul the Apostle was able to reach them. And then the Greeks were highly educated, highly enlightened. Their minds were refined to the limit almost. And yet Paul the Apostle was able to reach them. Among the wise, he presented the gospel in a logical manner. Among the barbarians and the unwise, he presented the gospel in a very simple way. To the books of the, to the, books of the Psalms, he reasoned with them in the Old Testament. Yet when he came to scholars that were devoted to contemporary literature, he would quote their poets unto them. Paul the Apostle, he was a man that was totally prepared to the legalistic Pharisees. He could talk to them and be at home. To the loose living pleasure lovers of Corinth, he was speaking to them and he was at home. How many of us have qualified ourselves like that? Why am I telling you this? Well, we're pointing out this in the Bible. I'm pointing out this because most of us here tonight are middle-aged believers. 30 years of age, 40 years of age, 45 years of age, 50 years of age. Most of us here, some much younger, some much older. Have you ever given yourself the challenge that as a Christian, as a believer, you know the Lord is calling you to preach. And when you come to people like Athenians, philosophers, great scientists, people that have read so much, you're not going to be a person that will not be able to present the gospel to them. But at your age, at 30, at 35, at 40, you can determine that I will read, I will study. If your English is not all right, you'll make up your mind, I will develop myself in English. Because it's necessary. The Holy Ghost isn't going to teach you English. The Holy Ghost isn't going to teach you the communication. You must learn. You must prepare yourself. Or if you are to meet sophisticated people, to develop yourself, to say, Lord, by your grace, not only praying, but reading, studying, qualifying yourself in every way possible to be able to reach them. But unfortunately, most Christian workers today are very, very lazy. Most Christian workers today will not read more than just read some verses of the Bible. They won't study English. They won't study communication. They won't study how to approach people. They won't study how to interest people. They won't study how to prepare a message. They won't study how to be able to proclaim the Lord Jesus Christ in a refined manner that will capture the people that are listening to them. Oh, they just preach in a haphazard, unprepared, unstructured manner and say, well, the Holy Ghost will convert them. Paul the Apostle was not like that. He was able to reach people of his own generation. I'm praying that the Lord will help us so that we too will be able to reach people of this generation in Jesus' name. I want you to see Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. From verse 14. I am debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise. What does it mean I'm a debtor to the Greeks? That means 
I have passion for them. I owe them something, and I must pay that debt. I must preach to them. Paul, suppose you don't understand their language, and Paul replies, I already understand their language. If I didn't, I would learn it. To the barbarians, suppose uh, you don't understand their culture and you cannot communicate with them, I will learn it because I am a debtor to them. But to the wise and to the unwise, Paul, suppose you are not wise and you say that you are a debtor to the wise, what are you going to do? I will make myself wise. I will read. I will study, I will learn the Bible, I will pray, I will beg God for grace, for revelation, for everything I need so that I can pay my debt to the wise. To the unwise, illiterate, common people, I will pray. I will learn their way so that I can pay my debt unto them. So that as much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. And that's the way we must equip ourselves. Equip ourselves. Now those who are our interpreters, now to be able to reach the people in your class as interpreters, you must study that uh, vernacular Bible. If you are an Igbo interpreter, Epic interpreter, Yoruba interpreter, but then you don't take time to even learn the language. Learn the language so that you can interpret properly and correctly so that the people you are interpreting to will be saved. Then how are we debtors to the wise and then to the unwise, to the Greeks and to the barbarians? Paul qualified himself in every way possible. And everything he did, he did perfectly well so that he can reach out to the people. And those of us that we feel the call of the Lord, we must do the same as well. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, from verse 22. For the Jews see, require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. And Paul the Apostle wanted to reach out to the Jews. You know what he had? He had the signs and the wonders of an apostle. The Greeks, the Jews are seeking for signs. He had it. And then the Greeks are seeking after wisdom. And he had the wisdom. Because he said in chapter 2 verse 6, How be it to speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor the princes of this world that come to naught, but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. Even the wisdom, the hidden wisdom, which God ordained before the world unto our glory. He paid his debt by getting himself qualified in Acts of the Apostles, chapter 22. Acts of the Apostles from chapter 21 from verse 37. As Paul was to be led into the castle, he said unto the chief captain, May I speak unto thee? Who said, Canst thou speak Greek? He had spoken in Greek to this man and said, Can I speak unto you? And he said it in Greek. In verse 38, are thou not that Egyptian, which before these days made an uproar and led us out into the wilderness four thousand men that were murderers? But Paul said, Paul said, in what language? In what language? In Greek. I am a man which am a Jew of Tarsus, a city in Cilicia, a citizen of no mean city, and I beseech thee, permit me, suffer me to speak unto the people. And when he had given him license, permission, Paul stood on the stairs and beckoned with the hand unto the people. And when there was made a great silence, he spake unto them in what? In the Hebrew tongue, that man was prepared. If he met Greeks, he could preach the gospel in Greek. If he met the Hebrews, he could preach the gospel in Hebrew. That's a prepared man. In knowledge, 
in sophistication, in philosophy, in the literary contemporary literature of that time, he was versed. In Judaism, he was trained under Gamaliel. Then in the languages of the people, he spoke the two important languages of the day, Greek and Hebrew. Verse chapter 22, verse 1. Men, brethren, and fathers, hear me, hear ye my defense which I make now unto you. And when they heard that he spake in the Hebrew tongue to them, they kept the more silence. That man was prepared. My question to you is, are you prepared? Not only in the language, spiritual ministration, logically presenting the Bible, logically telling the people what the will of the Lord is, and being able to reach everybody, reach the children, reach the women, reach the men, and talk to them and strike the chords of their hearts. Now, if you are not yet prepared, it's not too late. Most of us are young, and you can devote some hours of every day to qualifying yourself, saying, Oh Lord, I will study my Bible more. If I need to study English language personally, privately, I will do it. If I need to study communication, how to present the gospel logically, effectively, dynamically to other people, Lord, I will do it. All the hours it will take every day, and it won't take you more than one, two hours every day if it's regular, because one to two hours every day, if it's very regular, amounts to very, very much in a whole year, if it's regular. And you discipline yourself, you commit yourself to making sure that you are the type of person the Lord wants you to be. So now it's not for lazy people. It's only for those who determine to make a success of the thing that God wants them to do. Now the third point in Acts of the Apostles, chapter 18, verse 6 now. And when they opposed themselves and blasphemed, he shook his raiment and said unto them, Your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean. From henceforth I will go unto the Gentiles. Some of the people opposed. Some of the people blasphemed. They rejected what he was saying. Does that mean nobody got converted? No, not at all. Look at verse 7. And he departed thence and entered into a certain man's house named Justus, one that worshipped God, whose house joined hard, was very near to the synagogue. And Crispus, the chief ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all his house. And many of the Corinthians hearing believed and were baptized. There were converts. The chief ruler of the synagogue got converted. His household got converted. And Justus, whose house was very near the, uh, the synagogue, also got converted. And many of the Corinthians also seen that the chief uh, the chief ruler of the synagogue was converted. They also gave their lives to the Lord. But now, let's see what Paul the Apostle did. As an evangelist, he knew what the Lord had said. And he was evangelizing because of the Great Commission. He wasn't evangelizing because it was a popular thing to do. It wasn't popular. He wasn't evangelizing because he had some ulterior motives. No, there was no other motive. Just passion for souls, winning souls to the Lord, bringing them into the kingdom. And if it is to please the Lord, if it is to receive a well done from the Lord, do it the way the Lord has commanded. Now we say this because we're teaching ourselves. This is a church that is not interested in looking at what other people are doing outside there. The other people there, they are evangelizing, they are winning souls, they are doing church work, whatever they are doing. We are not their judge, God is their judge. If they do well, God will reward them. If they don't, it's between them and God. So anything I say as to how to evangelize, as to how to hold a crusade, as to what to do, is not to oppose anybody or criticize anybody. It is that this is a church and we are interested in this Bible church that we are going to do everything according to the word of God. And if we don't say it, how do we ever learn age? So I don't want you to go outside here and say, Oh, that uh, preacher is opposing all the other evangelists. I am not. 
but I'm interested in something. I'm interested that every member of this church will be exposed to the truth and that when you say that this church, an evangelist in this church, a preacher in this church is doing something, if, it is, if we're doing something biblical, do it in the Bible way, in the Bible pattern. Have you ever noticed from Acts of the Apostles, from the very beginning, that all these apostles and preachers that acted as evangelists, they preached the gospel, they didn't stop there, they baptized the believers, they didn't stop there, they established the church, they didn't stop there, they appointed elders to continue with them. It was, if it was already in the church, where there was a church, like in Jerusalem, all those people were added to the church. They were not told, you can go back to the synagogues if you want to. They were not told, you can go back to the rulers of the Jews if you want to. No. All the people that were born again, number one, after they were sure they were born again, they baptized them in water. After that, they added them to the church. Living church, dynamic church, growing church, Bible church. They need to tell them, you can go anywhere that you want. You can choose any place that you want and go and worship God in the synagogue and go and worship in the Sabbath and go and worship in that other place. If we're going to evangelize today as a church, as people that want to receive a well done from the Lord, we are going to do it according to the Bible pattern. Get them saved. Get them baptized in water. Make sure as a person that want them to the Lord that they are integrated to a living church, a Bible church. I don't mean deeper line. A real living church, dynamic church that is teaching according to the word of God. And if there is no living church in that place, establish one. Give them elders. Give them preachers. And if you don't find elders, stay with them yourself and get the work done. That's how they did it in the Acts of the Apostles. And it is written for us so that we can see and do the same thing. We're told in verse 8 that these people, many of the Corinthians hearing, believed and they were baptized. I mean, reading from all these um, evangelists, Billy Graham, Osborne, all these other evangelists. I'm not telling you that they are not Christians. I'm not telling you that they are not doing well. I am saying that I am yet to see that they will make the water baptism part of the evangelism. Because Jesus said, go and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. If we're going to obey the Lord, obey the Lord completely. And then after baptizing them, teaching them all things whatsoever I have commanded you, teaching them to observe all those things. And as a church, if we're going to evangelize, we must do everything the Lord has said. But you know, it will be unfortunate if I go to a place, for example, just last week we were in Ghana. We left uh, Lagos here on Tuesday and um, we started the meetings on Wednesday. We had workers retreat during the day for all the workers uh, of the Deeper Life uh, Church from all over Ghana. More than about 1,500 workers from all the nation. And then during the night we had miracle service. But then it would have been a useless thing to see all those blind eyes that got open, all the lame that walked, because just as we pray like that, even little children, little children that were, you know, blind, not able to see, their eyes just got open. The lame walking, many, many things happened. But listen to me, all that will be useless if there is no church standing on the Bible to continue with them after we had left. It will just be something that is exciting the people will just rejoice for those few days when they saw the blind receiving their sight the lame walking and other people with chronic chronic diseases brought from various places getting healed instantaneously coming out immediately to give testimonies it would be a useless thing if there was nobody a person that stood on the whole bible to do the water baptism to continue with them but what a joy that in the church yesterday where we held the uh, miracle service 
already before we got there that church was the single largest church in the whole of the town before we even got there and yet what a joy for the pastor to tell me that as a result of the miracle service we held during the week the church was about double just for yesterday Sunday and I just started follow up that's real work that's standing work we must be careful, we must be serious, we must be diligent. But thank God that God is teaching us all these things so that we will be able to do lasting work in Jesus' name. In verse 9, Then spake the Lord to Paul in the night by a vision, Be not afraid. Obviously, Paul was becoming afraid. The next time you become afraid, remember, there was a time Paul too was afraid. It's not a sin to get afraid. It doesn't mean you are no more a Christian if you are a little bit afraid. In fact, he said he was in fear, he was in weakness, he was in much trembling, yet he was a great man of God. My brother, my sister, in the work God has committed into your hand, as fellowship leader, area leader, zonal leader, a preacher, anyone, you know, some fears can come. Despondency can come. Discouragement can come. For you at that time to remember, even Paul, even Paul the Apostle, there were times, not many times, but there were times he was a little bit afraid. But then the Lord appeared to him in a night vision and said, Be not afraid, but speak. Hold not thy peace, for I am with thee. What a wonderful thing. That you get into a city, you are having crusade. You don't have many of those synagogues supporting you. But the God of heaven says, I am with you. And you don't have the millionaires of Corinth coming and saying, Now Paul, we are millionaires and we have decided that this crusade must be successful. Any, any amount of money you need, we are going to put everything down. You have no millionaires supporting you. But God says, I am with you. And the government officials don't come and say, Now, Paul, you're doing a great work in this, our city of Corinth. We are government officials. Anything you need, you need this, you need that. We are government officials. We assure you, we are supporting you. No government official, but the God of heaven said, I am with you. Most likely, if you, if God calls you to be an evangelist and you have crusades all about, it is most likely the journalists are not going to come and they are not going to say, oh yes, Paul the Apostle, you are a great evangelist. We are the journalists and we control the minds of the people. We control what they read and what they think. We are with you. No, they won't say that. The journalist may not be with you, but God, God of heaven said, I am with you. And no man shall set on thee to hurt thee. I think Paul must have been preaching sound doctrine. Let's face it. If you're a preacher and you just preach to be popular, you preach to be known, you preach just to be congratulated by human beings. God will not come to you and tell you I am with you and no man shall set on thee to hurt thee. Whatever you do for the Lord, have your eyes on the Lord. Have your mind on the Lord. Let him be the one you want to please at all costs. Whoever is offended, whoever is attracted, please the Lord. I started by telling you that Paul did not have distracting friends. Friends that distracted his attention. He wasn't trying to be popular with those friends. All he wanted was that he wanted to receive a well done from the Lord. And he did. And God said, Paul, you are getting afraid. No supporters. The synagogue has thrown you out. The journalists are not writing well about you. The government officials are thinking that you are going to destroy the government of Rome. And Rome governs uh, this provincial capital. But be not afraid. Keep on speaking. You are speaking well. You are speaking the right thing. Keep on speaking. Hold not thy peace. Paul, I am with you. Why are you afraid? No man shall set on thee to hurt thee. I'm your security. I'll protect you. 
Paul, I have much people in this city. Don't get tired now. Don't be wicked. Don't look back. All these many Corinthians that have been born again is just a little thing. Yet I have much people in this city. And there's no other person for me to depend upon Paul. No other preacher for me to depend upon. Get up, do it. And he continued there. A year and six months. If I were, I would. If I had his audible voice, if he revealed himself to me, if he encouraged me, if he told me I was preaching right, if he told me to keep on speaking the same thing I was saying, if he told me not to hold my peace, if he told me that he was with me and there was uh, no division, no barrier, no partition between me and him, if he told me that nobody will search any hand to hurt me, and if he told me that in this city he still has much people to be won into the kingdom, I will continue. And thank God that's what he's saying to every one of us. In your fellowship, there's still many people God wants to bring in. In your area, in your zone, there's still many people to bring in. In this city of Lagos where we are, there are still many, many people the Lord wants to bring in, into the fold, into the kingdom, to be born again. And in this country and in this continent of Africa, there are still many people. And we must continue. He continued there a year and six months teaching the word of God among them. Everywhere Paul preached the gospel, on a new soil, on a new land, he established the church. He taught them, then he appointed elders and leaders over them, and the churches kept going on. Thank God that he's teaching us all these things. And if we follow all these things that he's teaching us, without following the methods of contemporary preachers and evangelists, Without thinking that we are not doing right, without losing our perspective and distinctives, thinking that maybe we are maybe we're too strict, maybe we're keeping too close to the Bible. If we keep on as we're doing, following the Lord, following the scriptures, following the Spirit of God, the Lord will use us mightily in Jesus' name. Whatever you are doing, keep doing it for the Lord. And let the souls be one to the Lord. And whatever others are doing, do not be their judge, do not criticize them. But do not copy whatever you know is not totally based on the word of God. Keep your eyes on the shepherd and keep your mind on the scriptures. Let's rise up and pray. I want you to commit yourself to the Lord. The Lord has taught us again. He's revealed his mind, his will unto us. And he wants us to keep on in the world. Have you been afraid? Discouraged? Despondent? Why? The Lord is saying, I am with you. I have much people in this city. Arise and do the work. Arise and preach. Arise and harvest. Arise and win souls into the kingdom. Be not discouraged. He says, I am with you. Get the work done. Get the souls won. Get the church established. Win them. Win them one by one. Forget what other people are doing. Concentrate on what God wants you to do. Open yourself to the Spirit of God. Be led by the Spirit of God. And do the will of God. Do the work of God in a way that God himself will approve of it. Follow the biblical pattern. Follow the biblical pattern in evangelizing. 